are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. Hey, KLRN Radio family, this is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with me on Facebook at Southern Sisters Home with Jenny Earhart. You can also catch our Facebook Live videos, unedited and uncensored. I'm in Wen's World, and I love it. Yeah, baby! (laughs) Live at the Hyper Heterosonic Curse Fitness off of Bell's Ferry, here we are. (laughs) Gwinnett Griff and the Wens, live and local, hot takes and keen insights in Wens World. Radio Griff, Gwinnett Griff, how goes it? Going good, man. I'm glad to be here. Some big news coming down this week. The Gwinnett Braves name change, and I am psyched to discuss it with you. I have lots of hot takes on it. And lots of uh, keen insights on it as well, like you said. So uh, I'm ready to get into this, man. The Gwinnett Braves name change. You have to list the names, right? I do. I do. So they've decided they're going to change their name of the team next season. Yes. Um, So this week they released the six finalists. And one of these finalists will be the new name of the minor league baseball team in Gwinnett. Right. So let's hear them. But let it be known that we had a suggestion prior to these six finalists. We did. And I'm very disappointed because our suggestion, my name Griffin, and a griffin is also a mythological creature, like half bird, half lion uh, thing going on. It's it's a chimera. It's very scary. Right. Like if you saw it on the street, like (laughs) rolling down Peachtree. If you saw a real griffin flying through downtown Atlanta. I would soil myself. Exactly. Indeed. And uh, it has alliteration. Yep. Uh, has everything Griffin. you need for a team name, right? It's it's uh, intimidating, but also like kids can like it. It's a cool thing. Yeah, be a cool mascot. Uh, lots of cool things. It could be called the Griffs. Short little nickname. Sure, you know? the sure. G, the G Men, uh, whatever you want to call them. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't look like the Griffins made the you know one of the six finalists. They're not on the list. They are not. We're going to go through each of these six and debunk. Every option here as to why it doesn't make sense. They're all kind of terrible. They really are. So let's start with the one that I'll get the most hate mail about. Uh, A signer of the Declaration of Independence, Gwinnett Button. His name is Button Gwinnett. Gwinnett 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 Button, if you're reading. Gwinnett, comma, Button. Right. If you're reading his public record. Yeah, right. Uh, And based on what I've seen, that's the early on favorite of what people want. The Gwinnett Button. It's kind of a safe choice. And my opinion on it is that really doesn't solve anything. Because they kind of got rid of the Braves name because it was just kind of that we already have the Atlanta Braves, you know, 30 miles away. There's not much more you can do with the Braves. The Atlanta Braves are bravesed out. Gwinnett Buttons, what do you do with that? It's just kind of safe. It's because they're trying to be family friendly. You're not going to go with the butts. Sure. I just it's eh, it's kind of lame. Taking a look at it from the rear view, if you will. Hey, now I look at this as a foolish choice. First of all, the South seceded from the United States. (laughs) So it doesn't make sense to have somebody that represents Southern culture, a culture that's synonymous with certain stains in America's history. And I'm not sure about Gwinnett, comma, Button's stance on said problems in American history. He signed the Declaration of Independence, and that's all that matters, apparently. Right. And he's from Gwinnett, or Gwinnett's named after him. Right. Let's name the team the Buttons. Come on. and, And also, aren't Buttons so much more inconvenient than Zippers? 
Oh, that's a fact. You know, I have a child, and I hate when we have to use the onesies that are buttons, because it takes forever to change them. Right. The zippers are so much more efficient. So right. this is an inefficient choice from head to toe. Gwinnett zippers, that's already a better name. I like it. Yeah. It's quick. It makes that cool sound, and you can get sponsored by YKK. Why not? I love it. <laughs> As opposed to KKK with Gwinnett buttons. Hey! Right? <laughs> oh, hot takes and keen whoa, insights whoa, whoa, here whoa, in Winsboro. Send all hate mail to uh, <laughs> at Gwinnett Griff on Twitter. And if you can't find them, we're going to create a handle specifically <laughs> for this show. Uh, the next option was the Gwinnett Big Mouse, uh, named after the state fish of Georgia, the largemouth bass. Uh, it's a tribute to bass fishing on Lake Lanier. Can I just say... That hasn't Sweetwater already dominated this this it's area? True. I didn't even think of that. Right. And uh, I, the more I thought about it, I kind of started to lean towards Big Mouse. Okay. Because I think there's a lot you can kind of do with it. It might create a cool logo, maybe. But then it also gets kind of uh, a little risque, maybe. Right, right. To, I feel like a lot of people could take that name the wrong way very quickly. Sure. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be Big Mouse. I th- honestly... Because what they're saying, if you read the fine print, they're saying the uh, public's vote will count towards some of it. But in the end, the executives are making this final decision. Right. The fans aren't having to say. No, the people this don't matter. This is for show, honestly. Of course. And they've already decided it's going to be buttons. That's my opinion. But we'll go through the rest of the names. <laughs> you never know. You never know. But I, I don't think it's going to be Big Mouse. Well, just, maybe they'll hear this segment and then reconsider. We can hope. Like you said, Big Mouse are going to turn into some sexual connotation that's not safe for the whole family. So right, right. why even go down that path? Our minds are already warped enough. Don't give us extra ammo. Right. Uh, the next one was the Gwinnett Gobblers. And I, I just associate Gobblers with Thanksgiving, which is in the month of November, in which no baseball even takes place. So what are we doing here? <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't. Their description for gobblers was like people like to eat and hunt. Yeah, and stuff. So celebrating the outdoors, hunting and eating all the foods we love. And yeah. What would the mascot for that be? What would the logo look like for a gobbler? It would be a turkey, and everybody that's ever been called a turkey, it's synonymous with being yellow, which means you're a coward. Do you really want your team <laughs> to be a bunch of cowards, your lineup, a bunch of fearful people not swinging, looking at strike three? And I grew up in Gwinnett County, and I don't know if I ever saw a turkey, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, not a real one, at least. Right. You know, we have the gobble jog also, so it's been done. Right. Another thing that's been taken. Uh, the next was the Gwinnett Hush Pup. Uh, I guess the club's tidbit on this name, quote, our stealthy hunting dog is sneaking through the weeds, about to rustle up some ducks. But don't think we're all that serious. You can expect a corny fan experience at the puppies game. Now, I think there's a I could see them going with hush puppies because it's so family friendly. Kids would love it. You puppies, you you have like a puppy adoption day. You have puppies running all over the field, you know. Uh, lots of puppy things you can work out there. Sure. You throw in the word hush, hush puppies, uh, the hunting thing angle they have there, which is big here in Georgia. Indeed. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways they could go with that. It's a very family friendly, safe choice. But I think it's almost, as they even mentioned, uh, too corny. Right. I, I, it, it's a little much. I don't think that'll be it in the end. I have a problem with this. When I think of a quiet puppy, I think of a silenced puppy. And whenever I think of dead dogs, it's synonymous with puppy mills, Michael Vick, the whole the old <laughs> scandal from a few years back. This, to me, also rings of a, a cheap value meal at Captain D's. I don't want... That is really what I think of, too. Yeah! I think of those little... Which are delicious. And it always <laughs> gives me diarrhea. Do you really want me to associate this experience with diarrhea? It's not pleasant. Right. It's not. And it's hot. It's summer. You're sweating. It's just not a good scene. And I've already seen on social media and like even uh, people associated with the team already saying oh, it's not hush puppies that you eat. So they're already even with just naming it, naming it as a finalist. They're having to like clarify. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a loser. You're already going down a battery. It's a yeah. loser stance right. when you already have to say, no, that's not what it means. Right. No, it means what it means to the fans. Right. What it, yeah. And they're trying to change it. So that's debunked. Done. Uh, Gwinnett Lamb Chops. A chop off the old block. The Lamb Chops marries the region's love of home cooking with the tomahawk chop of the Atlanta Braves. Lamb Chops was kind of the one I thought through. I kind of liked it because it had the word chop in there. Kind okay. of a, you know, Atlanta Braves, tomahawk chop. All right, that. right. And then I was talking it over with a bud because they tie in like home southern cooking or something with lamb chops. Home, yeah, something like Who that. Sure. lamb in Atlanta, Georgia or in Gwinnett? Now, he, hmm. my buddy brought up a good point. What about the pork chops? Gwinnett. That is a cool idea. Southern cooking, pork. I don't like pork personally. I'm not a right. big pork guy because I like to eat healthy. But the chop, you also have tomahawk chop. So you have, I, that makes more sense as opposed to lamb chop. I agree. And lamb chop's a little child. I think of uh, 
The puppet. Yeah, Lamb Chop, Charlie up. Horse. Yeah, all that. Sherry with her, <laughs> with, you know, Lamb Chop's Great Adventures. Right, yeah. Charlie Haas. That's what I think of. Yeah. Uh, pork Chop's, uh, but I feel like there might already be a Pork Chop team out there somewhere. So who knows? You think soft, and when also we soft, think of yeah. we think of lambs, we think of sacrifice. You really want your team <laughs> to be the sacrifice of minor league baseball? Like you're just going to come in here and slaughter us, like lamb to the slaughter? No way, Jose! It's a terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, the next one is really just atrocious. The Gwinnett sweet teas. That doesn't even roll off the tongue. It's right. awful. There's too many syllables. There's a lot going on there, and it's a mess. They they listed that one last because they know there's no shot. Like it's the the sweet teas. They say the sweet tea celebrate the laid back lifestyle of Gwinnett County while displaying a real sweet look. I'm shaking my head. I know that doesn't translate well on radio. Oh, I can hear it. But I can hear it through your voice. Gracious. <laughs> That's a terrible. I, like, OK, there were 4000 submissions. And out of those 4000, there were 900 different names, uh, you know, submitted as sure. ideas. And those are the six best they're giving us. I think there were better ones that weren't as, I guess you could say, politically correct. I, and they kind of hinted at that. I read an article about it. They kind of hinted at that in the article saying, yeah, there were some that were really cool sounding names. But, you know, we, the more we looked into it, they had different meanings in different cultures and stuff like sure, that. Sure, sure. Like it's you, kind of slang for something. Sure, like some sort of derogatory term for a, a, a Native American tribe or right. something like that. You know, <laughs> and nowadays you can't be too careful. I mean, we just saw uh, finally they I put the, the, the Redskins. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. And it, to me, every time I see that, if there's anything that that totally is a mockery to Native Americans, which by the way they were here first, can we just put and that I'm to like rest? At least. A, 24th or 64th Native American. Right. So I can speak on this. Sure. And I'm giving you permission to speak on it. Sir, if I will thank you, I feel <laughs> I feel entitled. <laughs> yeah, it's go ahead. What were you going to say? No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say it's just so already borderline to me. I can't even bring myself to do the tomahawk chop. And mind you, that was not around before Dion Primetime Sanders came to the Atlanta Braves because right. he was a Seminole. So really, can you really do the same chop as a Seminole and a Brave? <laughs> I ask you that. I don't know. Gwinnett Nation. I, I like to chop, though. <laughs> Hashtag chop off as of late, though, with our major league team. Right. It hasn't been looking good. But, hey, they're getting rested right now. Uh, and, uh, they're going to come out strong. And they're going to win the NL East. That's a hot take. Wow. Prediction here you heard well. it here. I, hey, I don't know, man. But back to the name change. Sure. I have some exclusive info. Ooh. This is my own journal. I, you know, I have a journalism degree from the great Georgia State University. I've done a lot of research on this. And, um, you know, I use Google. And <laughs> me too. <laughs> the, the Gwinnett Braves or the, somebody has registered, you know, domain names oh. for five of the six. So smart. Get ahead of but it. But one of them hasn't been registered. Which one? Gobblers. So that makes me and all the other five were all registered on the same day. So that makes me which was about two weeks ago. It happened. So that makes me think the Gwinnett Braves, they registered those five names, knowing those were the finalists smartly. Sure. But they didn't register gobblers. Which makes me think Gobblers is already out. Right. That's not going to be Gobblers. So that's exclusive info for Wind's World. Mm. Gwinnett Gobblers will not be the name of the new uh, team. And the more I think about Sweet Tea, that project has already been underway and undertaken by former singer for Collective Soul, Ed Rowland. The Sweet Tea the Project. Sweet Tea Project, right. So why jump on something that's already been done? Right. So we're going to come back next week with the results. Hopefully they'll be. Is it next week? We'll know for uh, sure. If, if by uh, next week you mean early November. Oh, we're going to have to wait we have all to, summer Well, because they want to have like when they announce it, they want to have logos and uniforms ready to go. Oh, I see. So, so they already know they're giving this false feel, sense. of. I feel like they know. Sure. That, it's going to be the buttons. Let's be real. It's yeah. going to be the buttons. Oh, gosh. Gwinnett buttons, your new minor league baseball team. And they're going to get boycotted in immediately by a certain movement that's been boycotting everything historically. Oracle, yeah, as we, we need to look up. Maybe on the next episode of Wind's World, we can look into and uh, have a nice history discussion about Button Gwinnett. I think it's imperative <laughs> that we do that, because if you're going to have this guy as your mascot and the new face, as it were, of the Gwinnett Buttons, you want to know all this guy's demons. That's true. Because it, somebody's going to dig them up and it's going to be gonna a bad scene. eventually, so we may as well bring them out first. We're going to do it right here in Wind's World. Uh, follow Gwinnett Griff on Twitter. In the meantime, at Radio Griff and, of course, at Wind's World Radio. Go Buttons. Hey, KLRN Radio family. This is Jenny Earhart. 
Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with us at our website, southernsistershome.com, and on Facebook at Southern Sisters with Jenny Earhart. And don't forget to check out our Facebook Live videos. That's right, unedited and uncensored every week. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment. Reduce your payments by 30 to 50% and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Hi, I'm Caitlin from Reasons to Believe, and I believe that Wentz World is a GOAT. It's the greatest of all time. This is Wind's World, and it's weird science time. And it doesn't get much weirder than tree climbing, seed spitting goats that are actually good for the environment. It it doesn't. (laughs) And it's so interesting because our friend Anastasia sent me this picture that I totally thought she photoshopped of these goats in this tree. And then she actually put underneath, this is not photoshopped. So she (laughs) answered my next question before I even had to ask it. This is ridiculous. So, so Dr. Fazal Rana, I need you to help me fill in the blanks here. Where do we find these tree-hugging goats, if you will? Well, you know, believe it or not, goats climb trees all over the world. Wow. In fact, they're notorious for being really good climbers. Joey, maybe you or, or people in your audience have seen tricks where people will get goats to climb onto the back of chairs. And that just uh, exemplifies their their ability to climb. And so they'll climb trees when they can't get enough food on the ground. Mm. Normally, if they can graze in a pasture, they will take advantage of that. Uh, But if they can't get enough food that way, they will climb trees. And one place in the world that's famous for goats climbing trees is southern Morocco, uh, and specifically goats climb a special type of tree called an ergan tree, and in fact, the, the shepherds will actually prune the branches and cut limbs to make it easy for younger goats to get into these ergan trees so they can have at the, the leaves and the fruit on the trees. Why didn't I know this before right now? I feel like I missed that class at some point. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, I guess it's just not in our experience to see goats climbing into trees. I mean, we, we you know, see goats, you know, in, in places where they can readily graze uh, because we don't live in an arid environment. It's sure. really in arid environments where the, the, the weather is dry, the land is dry, where you don't have a lot of, of pastures and things like that. And under those conditions, trees are oftentimes the source of foliage for the goats to eat and so in those environments they will climb now do they have a preference for a specific kind of tree or is it just first come first serve well uh in southern morocco they uh, tend to try to encourage the goats to actually go into these argan trees and and the, the goats love to do that they love the leaves but they specifically love the fruit on the argan tree the fruit is like this uh, maybe the size of a really large olive and has kind of an olive flesh and seeds, and the goats will eat that fruit, you know, seed and all. And it turns out that scientists, believe it or not, are very interested in this behavior in southern Morocco because the ergan tree is indigenous to that part of the world. This is the only part of the world where that tree naturally grows. Now, people have planted the trees elsewhere, but this is its native environment. And they're concerned that if the shepherds are encouraging the goats to climb into these trees and eat up the, the foliage and the fruit, that right. it may decimate the population. But, but something else that's kind of interesting, too, it turns out that in recent years, the, the, the seeds from the ergan fruit actually turn out to be an economically vital part of 
southern Morocco because in Europe, people now prize the oil from Aragon uh, nuts and Aragon seeds. In fact, foodies will use that oil in, in special dishes, and uh, it's used in high-end cosmetics. And so this is actually leading to kind of a, a, a flush of cash into the southern Morocco economy. And the farmers who made money selling these seeds are now turning around and buying more goats. And so they're in kind of this this spiral where the more goats they have, the more trees that are being, uh, you know, used as a, a, a source of food for the goats. So I'm looking at the argon tree, and it says it's between 26 and 33 feet tall. How high are these goats climbing? These goats are going all the way to the top. Wow. I mean, they're not hanging around on the bottom limbs. And, you know, it's almost hysterical, but you'll see pictures where there's 10, 15 goats literally at the top of trees that we're joking off air. It looks like somebody literally photoshopped these, you know, these goats into the pictures, but they didn't. This is what these these crazy creatures are doing. So I've also skimmed articles that talk about the droppings of the goats once they eat the leaves and foliage off the argon tree that it's being sold in some capacity. It's a pretty pricey product. Do you know much about that? I don't know much about that, but I do know, again, that, that the, the seeds from the, from the argon trees are very valuable. And, of course, if the goats are you know, defecating the seeds after they eat the fruit or right. if they're regurgitating the seeds, that's an easy way to collect those seeds and then process them for the oil that's found within them. Uh, so I guess it, it kind of makes sense that... that their droppings would be worth something. <laughs> so looking at the, the aspects of, of argon oil, what purpose does it serve for mankind? Well, uh, for you know, the, the people of uh, South Morocco, Southern Morocco, it's really vital for their economy. Mm. Uh, but for, you know, people that are uh, foodies or into cosmetics, it really is more a, a specialty product. But what is interesting about this work is the fact that the, the goats are actually benefiting the argan trees, believe it or not. I mean, it sounds so, so their behavior to be so destructive, but they actually are uh, in, encouraging the survival of these trees and the well-being of these trees because they're, after eating the fruit through defecation and now also through regurgitation, they actually are dispersing the, 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 the seeds uh, all over the place, encouraging those trees to grow. And the further away the goats can get from the trees after they feed, the better it is for seed dispersal. It gives the, the argan trees a greater chance of surviving within that ecological system. So their behavior is actually serving a real benefit in keeping this particular type of tree alive. Wow, so true symbiosis, if you will. That, that's exactly it. You know, everything has a purpose in this creation, and this is just one of those examples where things that at the surface look to be problematic actually turn out to be a good thing. Wow, that's awesome. You know what? Dr. Fazal Rana is our go-to guy. All things research and apologetics at Reasons to Believe. You can connect with them online, reasons.org, and of course on Twitter at RTB underscore official. He is an author of several books, including Who is Adam, Creating Life in the Lab, The Cell's Design, and Dinosaur Blood and the Age of the Earth. He also holds a Ph.D. in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio University. Your reputation precedes you, sir. You are a scholar and a gentleman. Well, Joey, thank you so much for your kind words. It's great to spend time with you again. And we'll do it soon for sure. Yes. Part two of our chat with former Mossad spy Shalva Hassel, right after this. Hey, KLRN Radio family, this is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with us at our website, southernsistershome.com, and on Facebook at Southern Sisters with Jenny Earhart. And don't forget to check out our Facebook Live videos. That's right, unedited and uncensored every week. Welcome back to Wentz World, friends and listeners. Last week, we kicked off a dynamic chat with former spy Shalva Hessel. Check out her book. It's called Married to the Mossad. It's available on her website, shalvahessel.com, also on Amazon. So let's pick it back up where we left off with part two of our chat. When you were working with your husband as a spy working secret missions for Mossad, did your kids have any idea about what their mom was actually doing? Of course not. 
my kids didn't know. They, they, we had a different name. I was called Sally. My husband was called Jerry. We had a family name. Uh, our kids knew all the Muslim prayer. And we had a priest. And Christmas, we did what we do in Christmas. Nobody, they didn't know. They didn't see our family. They didn't know what is to have an aunt or an uncle. This is a very, very, uh, it's not simple. But, uh, you know, in, we had few friends, and those friends of ours, for instance, they didn't like Jews. <laughs> and they were talking about them, and we are sitting there, and we, are, we were the best friends. And uh, you learn, sometimes you feel you are one of them. This is the thing that never, all the time, understand why you came to this story, mm-hmm. that you came for a mission. And, uh, and, and this is the difficulty, and you can read it in the book, in Married to the Mossad. I talk about situations that the people ask me all sorts of questions, and I was worried, wow, they found me. I think they didn't believe me. And I had to make a decision whether to run away because you have a plan. If something happened, how do you run away? Right. Who takes the children? Right. What passports? It's very, very uh, difficult, but... It gave us a lot of benefits as well. Today, I have an investigation company, and I help other people. And many good things came out of it. But you never know what will be the outcome. I think everybody has to do something. You know, you, you have to live your life, but you have to have the courage sometimes and do something else, something good for somebody else. And if you do that, I think your your life is much more fulfilling. and must, It makes you much happier, I think. Absolutely. And I think a purpose greater than our own is what we were, in fact, created for. I know there's a lot of differences between culture and society. You know, I live in America. You live over in Tel Aviv, Israel. It's like night and day. And I I can only imagine what day to day life is there with the consistent tension between Muslims and Jews. And then on top. Actually, have you been to to Tel Aviv? You know what? I've always wanted to go, but I've always been somewhat. uh, I'm inviting you to Tel Aviv as my guest. Tel Aviv is a lively city. It's more than New York, more than London. It's very safe. All Israel. You, you know, when I lived, we lived in America for a, for a certain time. I was more concerned when my kids went out wow. as a teenager in America than they go out in Tel Aviv. Why is that? Because it's safe in Tel Aviv. Statistically, don't, you know, on television only, it's like when you work for the Mossad. You don't hear anything. When you hear about the Mossad, it's only when there is a mistake and something didn't work. Mm-hmm. It's the same what happens in Tel Aviv. When you hear something on the radio, it's when we had a small incident. But if you talk statistically, I think there are more people getting killed in, in America per capita than in Tel Aviv, than in Israel altogether. This is kind of a sidebar question, because as you know, President Donald Trump it has caused quite the stir around the world. And I know that he has been very supportive of Benjamin Netanyahu, strong ally with the president. The general sense of America, how has it changed? Is it better or worse than during the former Obama administration? I tell you, the Israeli feel that the American is our allies. And all Israeli, like we pray for our country and for our wealth, we pray for a strong America. Right. All of us. But we have different views. Some people are for the right, some people for the left. But uh, we feel that we are in the Middle East. We are fighting for America, for democracy, for freedom, for, for everything that America stands for. And we are surrounded by countries who have dictatorship that they don't give freedom for women. Can you believe it? They can, you can marry few women, and if a woman has look at another man, I don't want to tell you what will happen, the consequence. You can kill a woman and nothing will happen to you. Mm. And we are the only democracy in, in a small region. Now, when you have Trump, some people uh, like Trump because Trump uh, maybe is not politically correct, but he stands loud and clear when something is against America, he wants to get rid of it without any niceties. Right. I don't know if he will be successful or not. I hope for America he will. So some people are for Trump and some people were for Obama, you know. But everybody in Israel, they, we would like strong America and healthy America because for us, it's, of course, it's good because we both uh, stand for the same values. Now, Shalva, I want to kind of pick your brain a little bit. We're from different parts of the world. Uh, what do you feel as if is the greatest direct threat to democracy and decent people around the world? If you could just pinpoint it to maybe one or two different things or groups. Is it 
everybody become very selfish in one head, and we don't have a purpose. Everybody is for himself to start with. I think I think faith is very important. I think the world has changed a lot. I'm happy that in Israel we understood it a long time ago, and we understood understood what is the danger of all the extreme Islamic groups, and we take we know how to take care of it. And when I see what's happening in Europe now, it's it's really sad. It's very sad, and I'm very concerned. I hope that that more moderate uh, Muslims, which are good people, they will uh, rise up and will will stand uh, against uh, all the terror. It cannot be them. Then in Israel, you had terror. Right. <laughs> Everybody claps his hand when you're killing children, and you just have suicide bombers, and that's what happened. And today. Israel learned how to look after herself, and it happened in other places who condemn Israel before. And now they start to understand that, uh, wow, it's not Israel's fault, it's, it's, it's somebody else's fault. Here in the West, some people think that extreme Islam is purely, if you really boil it down, the, the purest form of Islam taken from the Quran. But you kind of differentiate. You, you say it's an extreme version, and there are a lot of good, peace-loving Muslims. Do you, though, feel like the center of the Quran and Islam is somewhat of a, a, a retribution, vengeance-based religion? I, I'd like you to speculate on that if you can. Look, I, I, I'm very traditional. I'm a Jewish. I'm very strong. I have a faith. And I know that in my if, if everybody will be a good Jew, the world will be very happy because no religion in the world teach you to kill somebody else. I don't believe in it. I think that when the Muslims will have equality between men and women, when the Muslim will accept that a, you cannot kill a woman and the woman has to right to marry whoever she wants, I think only this, something small, then something, is cha- something will change. I don't know if it's because it's very convenient to, to those uh, men who are sitting at the top, you know, in every country, and they have dictatorship, so they don't want to change it. Or it comes from the religion, or I think they use the religion. I don't believe it is. I don't know any book uh, in the Islam that, that guide them to do that. I don't think so. But what I'm surprised, that because I know in, our, in me as a Jew, a rabbi will object to any killing. This is number one. Or any wrongdoing to any human being. We're all equal. God created all of us. Right. It didn't create only of us, all of us the same. And that's why I'm very surprised that all the Muslims in the world are not rising up and condemn all these uh, people who are doing, who doing these horrible things. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are skeptical about Islam, because there hasn't really been a, a flashpoint where peace-loving Muslims have put their foot down and just said enough is enough because there's no line in the sand that somehow that's somewhat of an endorsement of these actions by their apathy. What say you on that? I agree 100% because I, and, and this is why I, in a way, I think that Trump, uh, doing the, he put a mirror to the world in, in his style, okay? But Trump put a mirror in the world. That's why in this era, it was very right for him to be elected. He put a mirror to show them, look, guys, these people are killing children. Look what happened in Syria. Everybody, all the free world went with Assad. They say he was educated. He's a doctor. He killed his own children, you know, with a, with a chemical weapon. You know what it is? His own people, nothing to do with Israel. And everybody blamed us. And I always say that, and people, you know, I even had a lot of argument with my husband, who is more liberal than me, is, look, how can we do peace with somebody like that? This is terrible what he's doing to his own people, for, and why? Why? Because he doesn't want democracy. He doesn't want to have an election, a proper one. He's afraid to lose his control, and he wants to be able to, to take the money wherever he needed to, and to do whatever he wants to do. And look at his wife. He's supposed to be educated, study in England. Why is she quiet? And we're going to pick up where we left off right here next week. Part three of our chat with Shalva Hessel. Married to the Mossad is the name of her book. It's available on her website, shalvahessel.com. You can also scoop it up on Amazon.
More Wentz World right after this. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the fresh start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. This is Dennis Prager and I am in Wen's World and I love it. My friends, welcome back to Wen's World. With front page news being anything but relevant for the American people, today I take exception because net neutrality is on the line. And on the line with us right now is Senior Fellow in Regulatory Policy at Heritage and ex-FCC Deputy Policy Chief, Mr. James Gattuso. Welcome to Wen's World, James. How goes it? Uh, It's fine. Well, help us to unpack what all this means, because so many of us are busy with day-to-day life, raising kids, being married, working our nine-to-fives, that these things can slip through the cracks. But net neutrality is such a pivotal issue for freedom, First Amendment rights, protection for an open-source Internet. Well, frankly, you know, I I take a skeptical view about the regulations to enforce net neutrality. Uh, Neutrality is the idea that all traffic that goes over the Internet all traffic that's that, that handled by internet service providers such as Verizon, Comcast, AT and T, should be treated exactly the same way. Now, now that that's a, a problem if you want any sort of marketplace for for internet, for internet commerce, for for ideas on the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, any marketplace I know of has premiums, it has discounts, it has flexibility, it has all those things that make a marketplace dynamic. And I'm afraid that that, that those pushing to Preserve the rules that, that that were put in place by the Obama administration on this, uh, on the internet, on uh, enforcing net neutrality, will actually destroy the marketplace and hurt, hurt broadband, hurt the internet. So this week in particular, a decision is being made, and it has a lot to do with Trump's FCC chairman, Ajit Pai. He wants to destroy net neutrality. Where is he coming from with this? Because doing a little bit of digging, he used to be uh, an attorney for Verizon. Do you think there's any closed-door deals, conversations that are help shaping his opinion as it pertains to net neutrality? Well, you know, I, I, I think Chairman uh, Pai is correct. Uh, I, I think he wants to restore freedom of the Internet. Uh, um, you know, the, the last thing we want, frankly, is for the government to be enforcing its idea of neutrality on broadband, on, on the Internet. And, and that, that, that is, that's what's happening. You know, the, all the uh, action this week and all the cries for neutrality really are coming as much from the big companies as from any grassroots with You have Google, you have Netflix. Right. You, you, you have um, Facebook. These are all big companies that have high market shares in their own areas. And I, I, I think it would be really a mistake to regulate the ISPs that they compete with. Right. So let me play devil's advocate for a mm-hmm. moment, because it seems as if if net neutrality was lost, the Internet wouldn't be what we've known it to be, which is an open source. And it's given way to innovation and a platform for people that may not have that platform. So it gives a voice to people that perhaps wouldn't have it. Uh, but do you feel like them blocking websites or content they don't like or applications that compete with their own offerings? That's a legitimate gripe. Would, would you agree or disagree with that? Well, remember that there's nothing in the net neutrality rules that, that, that were put into effect that that uh, are limited to big companies or companies with market power. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, the the first company that came up against an, a, a net neutrality investigation was T-Mobile, hmm. which is number three or four in the mobile marketplace, and it wanted to provide uh, a free sponsored data for for its customers in. in uh, cooperation with, with providers such as ESPN. Uh, the FCC uh, last year said that, that would be illegal, that, that, that they could not offer consumers that option. 
Mm-hmm. Even though market uh, T-Mobile has no market power, even though such a deal would be pro-consumer, and even though the content providers, ESPN wanted to provide it. But th- that, that's the way neutrality was being interpreted. Right, and and that's a fair interpretation to some. Others would argue that ISPs are the Internet's gatekeepers, and without net neutrality, that would give them the complete control and opportunity to profit from that position. What say you on that stance? Well, Google, in that sense, also has gatekeeper uh, ability. Facebook has, has gatekeeper responsibility. Uh, uh, Amazon, Microsoft. There are lots of gatekeepers on the Internet. The, the, the question is, are they abusing the power or are they using it to help people, to help grow the marketplace? And are they constrained by others? And I think all that is is, is positive. All that argues against regulation. Now, now suppose there, there was a problem. Suppose it's shown that AT&T or Verizon had been abusing their power. That's what we have antitrust laws for. The, the, those laws are in place. They've been enforced for 100 years. There's no reason not to apply them now. And, and that's a fair point, but could you see a world where internet service provider could, say, slow down its competitors' content or block political opinions if that it disagreed with? And we all know that there are a lot of lobbyists involved in this decision. With all that said, one could argue, say, follow the money and how that pertains to this decision coming up about net neutrality. Well, you know, it, this, this has been an issue for 10, maybe 15 years now. Sure. And there's not been one case where political dissension has been stifled due to the market power among an ISP or, frankly, among content providers. It's one of the most dynamic markets in America, both economically and politically. And again, if there was any effort to stifle speech, I think there are plenty of rivals. I would point that out, and a strategy such as that would backfire on any company that's trying to um, pursue it. And and I can see that point of view, but as of late, we both noticed how President Trump has addressed the media calling some outlets fake news, and it's hard to argue with some of his points, but in light of all of the goings-on as it pertains to our President Donald Trump and the way he views media, do you feel like his new FCC chairman is kind of echoing his sentiments and moving us toward a place where, you know, perhaps certain stories would be viewed as fake news, therefore be unavailable to the common public? No, in, in, in fact, Chairman Pai has been arguing against net neutrality for, for about five years now, if not more. He, he was a commissioner at the FCC for five years before he became chairman. He's been absolutely consistent that, that, that net neutrality is not needed as a regulation of the FCC and actually does, does harm. Uh, you know, any agenda that, that Donald Trump has has not affected his view at all, as far as I can tell. I can understand why there are certain people that are pro and certain people that are con. But on the surface level, it does look as if we are moving towards a more controlled environment as it pertains to the information that we receive. In your opinion, is there any positive aspects to net neutrality? Um, You you know, I mean, I think there there may be lots of reasons why a company would voluntarily pursue a neutral agenda or a neutral strategy. And a lot of companies do. Uh, in, in fact, AT&T itself joined up as, as, a, as a sponsoring member of the uh, Day of Action. Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, week here, we're celebrating here. Um, so I, I think there are lots of reasons they can be done in the marketplace, and a company would want to pursue that. But my problem is when the federal government imposes a solution. Uh, you know, federal regulation of any market, I think, is troublesome. Federal regulation of a market with such First Amendment implications worries me a lot. So can you see in America 10, 15 years from now, what would the Internet look like in a realistic scenario for everyday people like you and I if net neutrality is abolished completely? Well, I I think it'll be bigger. I think there'll be a lot more investment and a lot more innovation. You know, I I mentioned uh, T-Mobile's zero rating plan. It was an innovative way of getting data paid for, of getting more data into people's mobile phones and into their their use. So I think it's very much a positive scenario. 
what, what I worry about is if the rules that were placed into effect two years ago are allowed to continue. Right. I think we'll have more and more decision-making made by the FCC, made by Washington, and, and that's the scenario that bothers me. Well, some people would say that Pi wants to give control of the Internet to the companies that violated net neutrality for years before the FCC even adopted its rules in 2015. That would do nothing to protect users like you and I. What say you on that point? Well, you know, you know show me the violation that took place before 2015. Uh, uh, there, there is virtually no example uh, of, of a violation of the sort that, that the proponents of net neutrality regulation have, have talked about. Uh, um, you know, there, there, there are certainly decisions in the marketplace that, that you can disagree with. Sure. Strategies that, that, that you'd rather didn't take. But, but you know, th- th- there's been no attempt to stifle speech, no attempt to abuse marketplace positions. And every indication that if any of those things are tried, they would be stopped. Well, this has just been a fascinating conversation with James Gattuso. This man knows a lot about the FCC, how it works. He used to work for them. Uh, Also, he is a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. You can follow them on Twitter at Heritage. James, thank you so much for your time today, man. We really appreciate you here in One's World. Sure. Thank you. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment. Reduce your payments by 30 to 50% and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Hi, this is Vinny Bucci, a.k.a. The Booch of the Male Soap Opera Moment. Make sure you check out The Booch Cast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. Also, like the show on Facebook where you can find archived episodes. I'm in Wins World, and I love it. I love me some good old-fashioned wrestling. The Rock actually cares about this ongoing soap opera. This is your Male Soap Opera Moment. Bootsy, look out! There's great balls of fire everywhere! They're coming from the left! They're coming from the right! Boy, oh boy, it's mayhem here in Wentz World! Live and local, here with the one, the only, at Vince Bucci! Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. The fireworks have finally subsided, and uh, I think one of them blew up my soda. But don't worry, I think we're okay. <laughs> I think we're fine. Uh, I can st- It's still drinkable somewhat. But, uh, hey, we're back with the male soap opera moment, and boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. Indeed. Splish Splash, we're making a dash all the way back from Great Balls last Sunday on the WWE Network, which, by the way, Booch, I didn't know if you knew this or not, but you can get for a mere $9.99. So let's just go down the card. We made our predictions last week. Uh, Neville versus Akira Tazawa. Um, you know, honestly, I didn't see the match because it was pre-show. Did you see it? Nah, pre-show doesn't count. But speaking of predictions, <laughs> I am happy to announce the Booch is an 11-time prediction champion as wow. of right now. Amongst my, amongst my group of friends, we have a prediction tournament every year and I mean every month and whoever wins gets 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 the belt. For the 11th time, the Booch emerged victorious with his predictions of great balls of fire. And that is the very reason why Vince Bucci is a staple to the male soap opera moment right here in One's World. The man knows what he's talking about. Out, damn it. Uh, so let's go down the card here. Lesnar with Paul Heyman ringside taking on Samoa Joe. This to me was a great match. I agree. Yeah. The match was amazing. Um, uh, I felt it could have gone on a little bit longer uh, in, in terms of length, and I felt maybe maybe two F five should have did the trick in this particular case. But I do like the fact that Samoa Joe attacked Lesnar before the bell and putting him through the table. I thought was awesome. It was a great way to send a statement, and it was a great way to create doubt. And I love the fact that 
Le- it took multiple Coquia clutches and Lesnar having to like grab the ropes to get out of one, yeah. or and then at one point just lifting Lesnar with every bit of strength he had to break free and F5 him. So, and we saw six German suplexes. So both guys looked good. Both guys looked strong. Lesnar retained the title. So I can't complain. You know what? This is the thing that I loved about it only taking one F5 to uh, to beat Samoa Joe. This is why a finisher should always be a finisher in my mind. And I know we disagree sometimes, and that's quite okay. And that's what makes this show so splendid is a difference of opinion. I thought this match was awesome, and I love how you put that insight in there. The fact that Samoa Joe came out strong, put Brock Lesnar through the announce table, was exactly what he needed to do to create that doubt. Because initially, when you look at these two guys standing toe-to-toe, there's no way in hell Samoa Joe stands a chance. But as we've seen in weeks past on Monday Night Raw, he gave Brock Lesnar a run for his money, and he did so also a great balls of fire. Yeah, and and, and it showed that you know Lesnar had to sneak attack to get the advantage. Mm. So to have him sneak attack at the beginning makes perfect sense. Like he attacked Lesnar from behind when he locked in that coquilla clutch, and we saw his face turn pink, and he was fading out. Like they were all sneak attacks or cheap shots, and it showed that Lesnar's not Lesnar's just Lesnar wants the universal title. He's not looking for a straight-up man-to-man fight. He just wants to be the universal champion. He'll do whatever he's got to do. So it made Brock Lesnar the babyface, which is rare to see in a match. And to add an extra diamond to the Booch's championship belt, he got this one correct, prediction-wise. I thought Samoa Joe was going to win, and he got close, but no cigar there. Uh, But I will say I was correct on the Neville Akira Tozoa match. You were. But the pre-show doesn't count, so you're still up (laughs) 1-0. We'll move on down the line here. Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman. I'm embarrassed to... To admit this, but I like to be honest with uh, our participants here that I fell asleep during this match. Not because it was a bad match, but I was so freaking tired when I watched this. I woke up and the match was over and I was like, holy cow, I have to go back and rewind. <laughs> Fascinating. And even so that the, there's a petition going on online to have Roman Reigns brought up on charges of attempted murder. Yeah. How you, crazy is that? You know you know a storyline has people's attention when they're when when people are going on change.org or going on petitions <laughs> to do I think something happened with Braun a while back where he did something yeah. and people yes. wanted him locked up and then you got to tap the person on the shoulder and go it's entertainment, sir. Like, it's not. He's not going to go to jail because right. everything was pre planned in advance. Exactly. Like, and, but it is great when you see crazy stuff like that. Well, and, and that's the thing. When, when you create that kind of drama, you know you're doing it right. And creative did it right at Great Balls. Going back when I watched this match the second time, that stunt at the very end, the look on Angle's face, all the officials uh, in the garage area. If you don't have the network, we'll give it to you in a quick play by play here. In the garage area, Roman Reigns about kills Braun Strowman uh, with an ambulance and a truck, and it looked as if Braun Strowman was trapped, had to be taken out by the jaws of life, comes out bleeding, stumbling all over the place, easily concussed, but they sold it really well, and I was a fan of the way that they booked this match, how it all turned out, and moving forward, we have to see how this pans out as we move towards SummerSlam. Absolutely, and and what made it look so real, and I think this is why people did, is that they they threw in Curtis Axel and Heath Slater out of nowhere right. to entertain the audience because it was taking. Storyline wise, it was taking way too long than they thought to get that door pried open sure. because Roman really drove that thing in there. Yeah, it was so hard. it, I, I, like I said, it might have been a storyline. I'm sure there was some type of padding in there uh, to protect to Braun. Yeah, but it's it, it was one of those things where the impact it had to hurt him on some level. Sure. Like even so, like it's like getting hit in your car with your seatbelt on, you're still feeling. The momentum. Yeah. I mean, e- every action has an equal and opposite reaction. In this case, I mean, the, the speed at which Roman Reigns drove that vehicle was a lot faster than I thought perhaps they would use doing a stunt like this. Absolutely. And just to go back to something earlier, if, it makes, if this makes you feel any better, because uh, you said you kind of fell asleep a little bit during this match. Yeah. I fell asleep almost immediately after the match. I actually fell asleep when they put... I had to go back and watch Joe put... Uh, Brock to the table. Someone woke me up because they didn't realize I had faded because I had been up like I pretty much was an insomniac for the whole weekend. Right. So one of my buddies next to me like had to elbow me and I luckily I was able to see the main event match but I missed the going through the table. 
I could hear uh. the I could hear the intros, so I was kind of like, uh, duh, and then someone had to wake me up. So don't feel too bad about falling asleep. I nearly passed out too. If it hadn't been for my buddy, I would have missed the whole main event. Oh, it's crazy! I was on dad duty this weekend. The wife was working, so it was just me and my son. And he gets up super early, so throughout that whole day, I'm so excited about great balls. I'm like, yes, yes, tonight, tonight, and then tonight. Came and went, and I woke up. I'm like, oh, my God, I missed it. I can't believe I missed it. So I had to go back. But awesome match there between Reigns and Strowman. Um, Alexa Bliss and Sasha Banks. The end of this match straight up ticked me off. It, it should never end like this, and I hate that they book this. Stephanie McMahon is obviously in the background booking the ending to this. Booch, your hands are shaking and your mind is racing. Go for it. Hey, you were saying, Like you said, Stephanie is the one running this. So... How do you build a women's revolution and put count outs at the end is mind boggling to me. Not only that, you have Alexa Bliss actively just sit there. I can understand. I can understand like, okay, Sasha Banks hits her with a move. Alexa Bliss gets knocked unconscious and she can't get up. Or Sasha tries to get her back up, but then realizes they're going to get double counted out. So she jumps back in the ring and that's it. I probably would have been more acceptable. But when Alexa Bliss is just like, "Ah, I ain't going to get back in the ring. Again, acceptable for Raw, acceptable for SmackDown, not acceptable in a pay-per-view. That is the key. And I get it's just a Raw pay-per-view. I get that. But the purposes of the Raws and SmackDowns are to build up to this pay-per-view. So I don't mind seeing a disqualification. I don't mind seeing a count out on Raw and SmackDown. Because that means, okay, you're going to make me wait to the pay-per-view to see the clear-cut winner. There needs to be a clear-cut winner. The only exception I ever put on this was the Miz Ambrose match at Extreme Rules. Because the belt would change hands on a DQ. That's one of the rare moments where had there been a DQ and Miz won the title, I would have accepted it because it's in the stipulation. No, there was no stipulation for that. Should not have been an account. If you're going to give the win to Little Miss Blitz, you might as well have her beat Sasha Banks because he's beating everybody else. Man, fantastic insight. And we have so much more to discuss with Great Balls and then Raw the following evening and then SmackDown the evening after that. Catch us on demand, SoundCloud.com, free app in your phone's app store, up in the SoundCloud search bar, W-E-N-Z World. Till next week, have a nice day. Bang, bang. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. You are listening to KLRN Radio where liberty and reason still reign. 
Hey, KLRN Radio family, this is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with me on Facebook at Southern Sisters Home with Jenny Earhart. You can also catch our Facebook Live videos, unedited and uncensored. I'm in Wen's world, and I love it. Hey, what's going on, KLRN Radio family? This is The Wens. You can follow the show on Twitter, and we'll follow you back. At Wens World Radio, W E N Z World Radio. And be sure to check out my friend Jenny Earhart's website, SouthernSistersHome.com. Tons of cool stuff to see and read. We'll talk next Tuesday.